Okay, yep. Uh, we have a slight rearrangement here. Um, I hope you're all um, set for the second part. Um, and so the first one, you know, we try to get kind of like some general ethics down. And this is a, you know, a, a topic that we can really discuss. I mean, well, it has been discussed for over a thousand years, so and we, we're not gonna and we're not gonna close that box of Pandora now. But um, maybe opening up another one um, <laughs> would be nice now, um, which is where are we racing to? So um, I think generally we are pretty focused on um, on existentialists in in this community in in the sense of extinction. I would also like us to consider um, in this section um, the risk of racing to the bottom of and of not just re reaching our full potential. Um, there are also suffering risks. I'm going to um, bracket them out for now, even though they might also be potentially really important. Um, the Foundation Research Institute is doing really important work on that. For the question of like how likely we are to survive the century, I think that you know we all know that um, Stephen Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, and then I read on Luke Mulhäuser's blog that he said that if he had more time, he would like to write a book that's called Everything's Awesome and We're All Going to Die. <laughs> Um, kind of saying that even though we might be on a really good uh, kind of like trend and trajectory now, um, this can change really rapidly. Um, and there are several like forces that are stacked up against us, and I want to talk about them later. Um, Elia Zajkowski laid them out really well um, in, in Adequate Equilibria. But um, for now, maybe to start with, um, what is kind of like the main worry in terms of extinction that you have right now? Um, because we have AI, we have nukes being back on the table. <coughs> Uh, so I think Allison, may, may, maybe Allison handed me the mic because I, I recently finished reading this book by Daniel Ellsberg uh, called The Doomsday Machine, which I highly recommend to everyone. And this it sounds like half of you have read it already. For those of you who haven't, um, it's a history by a whistleblower who, who, who's worked with us at EFF quite a bit um, uh, of the... Um, the mistakes that were made during the planning processes around nuclear war, especially in the 50s, but really continuing all the way up through the, the 80s and 90s. And he documents seven or eight or nine of these instances where people basically optimized for the wrong thing and endangered the entire planet as a result of usually optimizing for get the other side, reliably with your nuclear weapons when you should be optimizing for avoid having a nuclear war at all. Um, and this stuff is, is straight out, literally straight out of Do Dr. Strangelove. In fact, he says in the book when he saw that film for the first time, um, you know, he was already working for the Rand Corporation and studying US military strategy. He said, how the hell did they know <laughs> that all these things were true? Um, and so uh, the answer was there was a British uh, nuclear strategist who'd consulted on the film who dropped lots of hints. Um, but we're still living in that world, unfortunately. Some of those risks have been mitigated, but there are other new ones that have been built into the system since then. And so you can kind of do this calculation and say, well, every year we take a small risk that's way too high of these things going wrong. Maybe it's 1%, maybe it's half a percent, maybe it's 2%. But over time, unless we do something about nuclear weapons risk, this is going to get us. Um, a, a series of errors where people didn't intend to put themselves on this path, that, like politicians will escalate and then some false alarm will go off and you get unlucky and the person who gets the false alarm won't be the, the wise kind of human who thus far it's always been a wise human. You know, Khrushchev and Kennedy were really wise in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. They both managed to, at enormous effort, reel in the apparatuses around them and, and avoid, you know, in two different places, situations where escalation was kind of entirely possible. Um, so I think we've got this risk from nukes and I think it's very different from the, the, the type of risk we talk about with AI, uh, but we're kind of facing both of them suddenly at this moment in history and we're gonna have to figure out how do we get mature as a species if you wanna live for a thousand years or 10,000 years, you can't have this risk accumulating at, at 1% a year. So first of all, I want to, to echo uh, the strong recommendation for Ellsworth's book and the uh, opinion that of the existential risks facing us, uh, nuclear war and nuclear winter is right up there. Is, 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 um, for me, it's either number one or number two. Number two is not AI. Um, uh, it's um, uh, with increasing capacity of, of biotechnology, it's engineered plagues. Um, I don't have the expertise to, to do an informed judgment of that. Um, and. Um, and right now, I think uh, um, 
the way the world could end tomorrow uh, is um, a nuclear war. Now, the, the, the relevance of this to the AI debates is as follows. In a world of multilateral possession of nuclear weapons where multiple countries are able to launch them, if the idea of the singleton that's going around in AI circles, uh, the singleton uh, from uh, Yudkowsky and Nick Bostrom uh, is this idea that whoever gets to AI breakthrough first, there's this runaway AI breakthrough. The AI is so much smarter than us that this unilateral AI is able to do a unilateral permanent military takeover of everything that can never be overthrown. If whether or not that notion should ever be credible, whether or not it might ever happen, if the idea becomes credible, you've created a first strike instability. If anybody anticipates that someone else is about to get to Singleton, launching a nuclear war is actually a good move because it's your last chance to stop them. Wouldn't it be enough to just launch like biologically engineered weapon or something that like a dirty ball, well, something so, that is not as kind of like so crude, so. but if you can stop them um, with with less effort and less destructiveness, clearly that would be a better move. Uh, if it's a if it's a large scale nation state that is shielding the thing, uh, then uh, you 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 know how how far it has to escalate before the threatened country feels like they can be assured of preventing the danger uh, is, you know, is an interesting question. I think that um, uh, one of the things that's a um, existential risk is in our current world and going forward is anything that creates a first strike instability. The architects of mutually assured destruction uh, faced the first strike instability problem. They o had only options in front of them, all of which looked crazy. Um, they knew they, that all the options looked crazy. Uh, they picked the option that looked least crazy, and they had to go to sleep at night knowing that this option that they chose, the mutually assured destruction option, they might have bet wrong and they were playing with humanity's future, um, but they, they lived up to the challenge of making a choice and doing something, and... Um yeah, I think Danny Alpert called it the lasso of rationality and then like criminal insanity. That like each, uh, you know, like that all the options that were faced were just, um, were pretty credible and they might have also as well not worked, mm -hmm. in which case it wouldn't be. It. But mm -hmm. I think you were talk touching on that risk of, the risk of, um, nuclear uh, destruction being exacerbated almost by an AI arms race. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to hear your um, perspective on the relationship between AI and nukes um, and also which, which of the arms races. I'll, I'll just say briefly, I estimate a much lower risk of extinction than I think the most of other people do, just because I think it's really hard not only to kill all humans, but you know, in you know, one in a thousand or something. But but I I think it's because even if you had a nuclear war and you kill, killed off most humans, there'd still be a few left. And, and estimate risk of extinction in this century. By the way, before we do that, can we define? Are we truly meaning every last human is dead, or do we mean like civilization collapses and we're back at the stone age? Because uh, let's do extinction now because ways. we're talking about. Total okay. extinction right now, and then later we're going to talk about something like that. And I would go further. I would say, you know, if you kill off all the humans, but there's still other monkeys around, <laughs> and they can evolve some, you know, return to something like human levels within a few million years, that's mostly a win scenario. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so so the, 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 the bad scenario is really you, you kill off all chance of okay, rising to this level again. And I'd put that at one in a thousand over the next century. But, but I'd still be willing to pay half of GDP to lower that probability by half. Okay. It's, it's so important. Even if it's very small. Sure, why not more? Why not more? Yes. <laughs> so you want no humans by the end of the century? No, no humans, no monkeys, <laughs> nothing that can no evolve. Humans. No, no humans. Nothing that can So when, humans? you know, when, when Paul mentioned just survive, survive, don't die, the opposite of that. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Laughing, they can even evolve into humans. Like, no, no, just humans. Human extinction. Okay. Human extinction. You okay. Okay. Human extinction. Human extinction. All right. Yeah. All right. That's. Um, I'd say, I don't know, under 50%. I'm going to go with 30%. Uh, 40%, but that's the number I just made up. Okay, of course you made it up. That's how we always make it up. I'm going to go last on this one. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty uncertain about this, but I'd go, like, if I'm feeling really pessimistic, 1% chance of extinction. Maybe, okay, that really pessimistic 10% chance of extinction. There's something coming for us that we don't know about. And then optimistic, like we're really robust, like 10, one in 10,000. Like it's somewhere down in that range. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, I think for me, this is going to count a lot or depend a lot on like how one reasons about AI and like many of the AI scenarios. Like it seems the most natural to think about the trajectory of civilization and value lost in the future rather than extinction per se. Um, if we bracket AI for the moment, like I would probably be in ballpark of like five or 10% where the great majority of that is from technologies that we don't yet have access to. And like something like maybe a few percent is from bio risk. I don't know no shit about bio risk. And maybe like on the order of 1% from nuclear war. Okay, so you like think um, bio, risk is, bio risk is higher than nuclear risk? Bio risk certainly seems higher than nuclear risk because the mechanisms are much more poorly understood. It's, it's, like have a reasonable sense it's like fairly hard to kill everyone with a nuclear war. Yeah, um, Hillary Clinton in 2011 said um, in an address to the um, to the Biological Weapons Convention in Geneva, she said, less than a year ago, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula made a call to arms for, and I quote, brothers with degree in microbiology or chemistry to develop a weapon of mass destruction. That was 2011, and it seems like in terms of like engineering that forward, um, that, that, that we're really facing um, a proper research, but I just wasn't aware that you would actually higher than nuclear. Mass destruction. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> but he would, he is saying that it's, that he thinks that mass, that extinction is likelier by biological weapons than by nu nuclear weapons. Yeah. yeah, but we have both isolated populations and really sophisticated research facilities, right? We're not naked against a pathogen like we were with the Great, the great Plague or whatever, right? Like we, we can fight back. And that they didn't recruit anyone that did it is, is optimistic, I would say. So um, I'm, I want to introduce a observation that uh, uh, da something David Friedman said a long time ago was the, the inspiration for. The world itself is something that we're mostly in ignorance of. Um, uh, you, know, we, we, um, you can think of the difference between the world as it is and the world we imagine it to be as a large number of knobs that we don't know the setting of, a large number of variables that can range over some, some very wide range. And with some settings of the knob, some possible um, worlds that might be the current world, uh, the, um, uh, the feedback loops, the self-corrective measures, um, uh, the, the, the ability of, of, of you know, people to anticipate problems and, and, and have good influences and all these things, all of this might be so robust that pretty much no matter what we do, we're going to have the great glorious future that, that um, Allison showed as the existential hope up arrow on her diagram. On the other hand, for another large mass, you can think of the, this, that set of possible futures as being sort of a probability mass in the space. For another probability mass in the space of po possible settings of these variables, um, everything's going to go to shit. We're all going to die. It doesn't matter what we do. It's 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 over. You know, we just it's just a matter of time before the other shoe drops. So that's another mass of the probability space. So I want to opt out of the question because it doesn't matter how big those two masses of the probability space are, if the question is not what will probably happen, but if the question is, what should we do? If the question is, what should we do, the right thing to, to, to take, the right approach to take to those sets of possible worlds is triage. Um, in both of those probability masses on the end, what we do doesn't make a difference. So let's take a look at, at what settings of these variables is it possible that what we do makes a difference and concentrate on that set of possible futures? Because if it's not in that set, it doesn't matter anyway. Sure, but doesn't knowing the probability, if, if we now magically knew the probability of human extinction, um, wouldn't that help us gauge actions? And it's not 
totally mm -hmm. No, but I mean, like we're talking about as well. There's a lot of most people don't actually care very much about the future. So for those people, if this intersection, if this intermediate range is really small, they go hell with it. I'm just going to live my life and enjoy we don't enjoy it now, those right? Here. Well, <laughs> but, but if you want to motivate those people, you will need to talk about the absolute probability. Okay, so can I throw a little bit of a contrasting opinion in here, or just to to further the point of what can we do? Um, Shouldn't it, instead of triage, be more um, just before the fact? So if you think about, uh, if you're saying nuke war is basically the killer of the, the human race or, or nuclear. nuclear war, um, um, or AI, you're putting these two as separate things, isn't there an argument that cyber warfare could be stronger than both, um, as it would uh, either control those two things? Because uh, AI or, or bio uh, would require dispersing uh, and technology to do that, and then warfare is pulling the trigger technologically. So wouldn't cyber warfare be the strongest of the three? I, I was dying to add to Christine's list of things that you could do that were sort of, sort of regret-free for the future, like make the computer secure. Right? If we can do something for people like 100 years from now, like sit down and do the super hard work of not making, <coughs> not deploying devices everywhere. I've heard one counter argument against this with which I don't agree, which is that um, having not secure cyber, uh, having cyber insecurity makes kinetic warfare less likely because people might um, use cyber warfare instead of kinetic warfare. <laughs> For one thing, I mean, I, th I think Mark is totally on board um, with cybersecurity being um, probably the most important. Like, he basically thinks that AI, um, that the threat of AI is, is already contained in the threat of cyber, cyber insecurities. And um, we had a debate on strengthening civilization at the Internet Archive, where Brewster hosted us, um, um, where we discussed this. I wanted to ask, the when you mentioned breaking out AI, and then you made your um, kind of like your um, your hedges for for extinction. I, I want to break it in AI in the sense that um, so Robin has had the AI foom debate um, with Eliza, um, and then there were certain updates on this. I would like to know from all of you what your kind of what your projection of the trajectory of AI is. Is it foom? Is it um, a slow, gradual, um, gradual increase in capability here? And what should we do? So I guess, I think people describe different things as FOOM. So amongst the community of people who think about AI safety or like ineffective altruists, I'm normally considered like an advocate for like slow takeoff. And by that I mean there will be a period like on the order of one to a few years where one transitions between AI being very economically important to being like a large driver of economic growth or having like a you know, factor of two effect on economic growth rates. Um, so like, yeah, a period of a few years between AI is a very big deal and uh, like the world is growing many times faster than it was before. And maybe then add like an extra year or six months or something till technological maturity. Um, I don't know if that's, yeah. With respect to bracketing out, like I guess my view would be that AI risk is like significantly more important than the other extinction risks yeah. we're discussing here. And that like I would trade like probably a roughly doubling of other extinction risks for elimination of AI risk, like something in that ballpark. Could, okay. could I suggest that each person say what is the risky scenario to focus on? What, okay. What's the bad thing that could happen that you're most focused on? In terms of AI. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you said the economy was growing it really fast. That's not the bad thing, right? That's not the bad thing. <laughs> that will be looking into the world like the salient thing, perhaps, yeah, from the outside. Right, but um, what's the bad thing? Yes, yeah, so from the perspective of humans, it's that we'll have a bunch of AI systems doing things no human wants and no institution wants. Um, so this would be an instance of value drift, or what you described as value drift. I'd be happy to argue about whether this is undesirable or the extent to which it is analogous. One percent of them, or three quarters of them? Or uh, what fraction of the machines? That you're worried about. Are you worried about 1% of them getting out of control? Uh, I, would, I would worry about the majority of machines doing things no human or institution wants. And you uh, think that's, is, that risk is higher, like a rogue AI, is, that risk is higher than the one of weaponization of uh, AGI? Well, I mean, so weaponization of AI seems extremely likely, barring some kind of extreme... And that's like weaponization of industry. Like, the way you yeah. fight wars is, in fact, it's important that we have the Industrial Revolution if you want to understand what a modern world looks like. And likewise, it will most likely be important that we've developed AI. Also, everything I'm saying here is not the view of my employer, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> but like, just on prior, as you'd guess, that it would be an extremely important part of the way wars are fought. And then the question is just like, how much value is destroyed from each of these things? I think AI doing something no one wants is like the way, one of the ways that the most value I see being destroyed in the world. Mm -hmm. That is like, again, I think that more than 10% of the total value of our future is in expectation lost over the course of the next like 100 years from people building machines that do something no human wants. Okay. That's my view. Yeah. 
Uh, I think the risks I'm most worried about, uh, there are a few of them, but geopolitical instability as a result of the like emergence of this technology, I'm kind of with you on the, like, I think that like a few, we'll have a few years of it playing out uh, before it um, looks something like a, you know, a new life form that's taking over the planet. But um, crazy stuff might happen during that period of time and it could be very destabilizing for existing political orders and I think the idea of nuking someone because they're about to build AGI is unlikely and extreme, but all sorts of other weird things are possible. Um, and I also think, I think the other risk I'm really worried about is that the, the AGIs themselves wind up competing violently over the available resources that they care about. Uh, and that uh, if we don't set up a, like a kind of a, a constitutional framework or, you know, a, a framework of co cooperation for the, the entities and actors in that, period of time in advance then uh the incentives to to be very like uh proactive into hacking into other people's you know data centers is just way too high so we should try to plan for and control those risks in advance i want to tie the ai dangers into the computer security issues i think they're very very directly related um often when i ask ai risks people for you know sort of a concrete scenario about how it starts it often starts uh, in their telling of it with, with steps that in other contexts would be described as massive cyber war. Um, uh, so then you say, okay, well, if that's sort of the disaster scenario, what level of AI is necessary for that disaster to happen? Um, you know, the, the AIs that, that could cause that disaster to happen don't have to seem human, they don't have to speak English, um, you know, there, there's just all sorts of things that are lumped into AGI, which have nothing to do with using computer insecurity to destroy civilization. Not extinction, but really bring civilization down. Um, uh, so when you actually get down to what level of AI is needed to uh, take massive advantage of the current massive insecurability of our computer infrastructure and bring civilization down, the answer is the thresholds behind us. We're already living after that threshold. Um, and uh, I, do th I do agree that the, uh, the tremendous priority on um, uh, making it from here to secure computing, and once you are in secure computing, then to me, AI is no longer a danger. It's the opportunity it always should have been. It, it's um, uh, the world economy is a cooperative system of both humans and software creatures, including AIs already. The growth of AIs as, not AGIs, but the growth of AIs as a component of the wealth generating process of civilization is accelerating. It's going to continue to accelerate. Um, and the overall intelligent system to keep our eye on is civilization as a whole, which will continue to be composed of cooperative relationships between humans and software entities. Um, uh, I don't know who I'm going to right now, but I, I wanted to clarify something. Uh, you say that the AI technology that we have is currently sufficient to bring down civilization? Yes. Do you mean that I personally could bring down civilization if I so chose? Today, today it would take a serious multi, multidisciplinary team uh, making a concerted effort, probably for years, to put together the uh, an adequate pathogen which could go out into the world, discover vulnerabilities, construct exploits, and attack. And right now, none of the teams that are capable of doing that are inclined to do it. I think the NSA may have much of the capacity. I think they were interested in building this level of destructiveness. I think they might be able to gather the capacity. I don't think they're interested in releasing it right now, but we're not in a, sh we're not in a major shooting war with a, tr with a major adversary right now. Things can change. I, I would say we, I, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we could be there in five to ten years. Let, let me just give one example scenario involving just two, just two elements brought together. Um, uh, there's about, there's shortly going to be millions of self-driving cars on the road. Uh, these self-driving cars, uh, their, their, their fancy AI perception steering systems run on top of fucking Unix, I asked. Um, uh, there is no reason to believe 
that the underlying infrastructure on which they're running uh, has been made strongly resistant to corruption. Uh, imagine a day when there are millions of self-driving cars on the road. They've all been corrupted, but nobody's noticed. And on trigger day, they all use all of this fancy capability that we've already put into them today to recognize crowds and steer into them at high speed. We're putting guided missiles on the road in large numbers. The AI safety, when people talk about AI safety, none of the, the things they normally talk about is even relevant. You don't have to mislead the AI. You don't have to cause it to misperceive something. You just use the capacity that we've lovingly put into these self-guided missiles we're putting on the road, and you just use that capacity for another purpose. Um, so imagine that that happens all over the world one day, millions of cars simultaneously doing that, and then it's the day after that that uh, many power grids in many large countries go down so that the day after people experience this attack, now they're out of communication and wondering how bad the overall situation is. Um, the, the consequence of those two things coupled, just those two things, not, not bringing into account any of the other nightmares that I'm way too uh, inclined to think about, um, uh, uh, I think that could cause a level of panic um, and a level of taboo against using programmable devices going forward. And, and at that point, the, car the carrying capacity of our civilization drops. And if it drops, for example, from 7 billion to 1 billion, that's a holocaust of 6 billion people. It's not extinction, but, but it's a tragedy that we can't even conceive of. But the technologies that sustain life are not the ones that could necessarily be used in that way, the, in terms of like the fertilizer and the distribution networks. So the, the leap that I'm making, and it's, and it's quite a leap, um, uh, so let me admit that it's a leap, is from these two panic-inducing events, um, together with, let's say, other pervasive corruptions of devices, leading to a general unwillingness to continue to use programmable devices. And at that point, the, 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 the economy that we've built can no longer function, and we no longer, can, we can't simply fall back to the level of technology from the 30s, because the whole ecosystem of interacting industrial capacity uh, was a non-computer-based ecosystem. We don't have that to fall back on. You're talking about would, would also just have a catastrophic impact on the food supply chain. Like, we, if you'd crash cars all over the roads, like, civilization falls apart, you can't, you can't do agriculture and get the food into supermarkets. But the odds, I think this risk is like, it's not here yet. It's sort of five to 10 years away. And it assumes that you don't have automated defenses that start getting deployed that have some chance of stopping someone who's insane enough to try this. And it's also the case that I think the actors who are competent enough to do this probably don't want to. Um, like, I don't think the, like, the terrorist organizations have this competence and I don't think nation states want to destroy the world. I'm a professor of economics and, and I've been around AI people and listening to as much detail as I can for years, but still my default is to say, this looks a lot like previous economic revolutions and to ask whether there's really any strong argument for this being substantially different. So if we go back to the industrial revolution, uh, there were enormous disruptions in terms of some countries rising relative to others and that sometimes induced war because often people are jealous of a, what was once a lower country rising to be above them. Uh, in, say, Britain uh, at the time, the aristocrats uh, failed to invest in industry <laughs> and there was enormous change in who was the rich people <laughs> because the aristocrats uh, lost relative wealth as a new generation of people got rich. That also created a lot of social disruption. Uh, you can think of that as literally <laughs> losing control. <laughs> You're the aristocrats. <laughs> you own most of the wealth. This new set of people comes up with different value and culture. They now own most of the wealth and now they are running the world, your world. And so I can definitely see those kinds of risks, disruptions with an AI revolution, i.e. Uh, AI show up, p people don't invest in them uniformly, some people win, some people lose, now different groups of people are in more control. Uh, there's jealousy, there's opportunities for war, <laughs> there's a chance to undermine, and this is what we saw in the Industrial Revolution. 
And this is the sort of thing I would, by default, expect you would also see in an AI revolution happening over a shorter time because it changes would be faster. It's not clear to me that there are that the risks is much higher than that. I mean, I want to hear more concrete reasons why <laughs> this new scenario is is more of a risk than than those things we saw in the past. But in the past, those were enough to worry about. Have you updated your views in terms of AI boom given AlphaGo and AlphaZero, or do you think it's uh, it's, it's basically still, I still have the same opinion after those developments. Um, I'll take a minute to clarify. Uh, I say well, we see a distribution of lumpiness and innovation in all fields. Uh, in all fields, there are a few very large lumps and lots of little lumps, and most of the integrals in the small lumps. This is true in com most fields of computer science. It's in true in AI. It's true in chemistry. It's true in you know weapons, etc. Uh, if you actually look at um, citations, it turns out that this shape of the distribution of inequality is constant across fields. It looks like it has the same distribution of lumpiness for cite at least academic citations across fields. Uh, the key question then is, if we, we've seen in the past that computer science in general and AI in general in the past has, has had this usual shape of lumpiness where there's a few big lumps but lots of small lumps, is there evidence that the distribution of lumpiness has changed recently or will change in the near future? That's the key question. <laughs> All right, that is the key question. Now, I take the analogy to 9-11. Like, before 9-11, we had a distribution of terrorist attacks. <laughs> Most of them pretty small, a few bigger, and then 9-11 shows up, and it's a record terrorist attack. And many people said, the distribution of terrorist attacks has just changed. We're now about to see a lot more big terrorist attacks, because look, statistically significant, this was way out of the distribution. We did not. <laughs> In fact, the distribution went back to the past. It was just a high draw. And a key question is, have recent developments been, you know, are they best explained as a high draw out of the usual distribution, or are they a consistent trend that's, that would see, seem statistically different from the past? And I got to say, having looked at the major revolutions in computer science over the last half century, AlphaGo looks within the class of those things. <laughs> I think if you look at the progress that machine learning has made over the last 10 years, it's got probably at least 10 things that big in it. Um, they don't get as much press splash because DeepMind is really good uh, like at PR and getting a fancy nature paper and getting a fancy video out there. But if you actually look at the progress of the field, it's astonishing. I also wanted to dive in on your industrial Re revolution metaphor. I think that's one of the possibilities. Another possibility is that we're kind of looking, we're like the prokaryotes. Uh, and then, you know, when you have eukaryotic life that, that like, and multicellular life emerging, like, what comes afterwards is just so profoundly different than what came beforehand that you, you're you not just talking about a revolution, you're talking about totally different values and totally different things being important. Or if it's cyanobacteria, it's like a totally different world where like different ingredients exist for, for thriving. Um, and so I think there's some chance that, that this AI transition looks industrial revolution-ish, but I'd probably bet more on the prokaryotic prokaryot, eukaryot side in you know, a hundred year time scale. I just said there's a lot of revolutions we've seen in the past and I have a long discussion about what future revolutions are most likely to be like. And I think because the modern economy has certain features, then that drives the similarity in my mind. My negative scenario is similar to Marx with one exception, which is you like the self-driving car example. I like the electric power uh, example, which I think is more compelling. So um, this is predates AGI. It could be done today with sufficient effort on the part of a state actor, but I don't think we have any evidence that that is going to happen soon, but it could happen, which is take out the electric power for months in the whole country. Something like that, but you could do it deliberately, right? <laughs> right. So I mean, it wouldn't kill everyone, but it would kill most of us, for sure. I, I mean, the vast majority, I think. So, so that's my scenario that scares me much more than the self-driving car example. Oh, that's kind of a sexier example. Uh, and then in terms of is it foom or a slow growth, I mean, I come at this from a policy perspective. And to me, the difference between the foom and the slow growth is very small. We don't have any time in either case. So from, from my perspective, it's like it doesn't really matter in a way because it, both of them are very, very fast from a policy perspective. Um, I like the slow growth one because it, well, it might... Well, hmm? What's the scary end state? What's the scary end state? For, you mean, uh, for okay. either one of those, if they're both the same, where does it end up that you're scared? Because some of the stories we've heard, it's not something to be scared of, and others, maybe it is. Well, I th I, you, I, you know me. I mean, I tend to come out where Mark is, which is if we could, some, if we could somehow get computer security, 
then it would, it would change everything and it would change AI back into a, what we hope would be a, a positive thing. Um, I was about to say, uh, I pretty much agree with Paul uh, on all of his major points, I think. Um, I would like to add that in addition to the single biggest risk, which is I think that AI is doing things that humans don't want, um, once AI gets sufficiently powerful, in addition to that and on top of that, we do have to worry about AIs doing things that individual humans want, but that turn out to be bad. Like there's the mutual assured destruction scenarios. There's the, you know, the Cold War, but with much more sophisticated weapons scenarios. There's the general instability scenarios of, uh, I think Peter mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, someone, uh, uh, one country is nukes another because, you know, they think they're going to develop AGI is kind of unlikely. Um, I think one country nukes another because, you know, they've already developed AGI and like, you know, all of their computers are like in the process of being hacked over the next 20 minutes um, it, it is much more likely. Like, you know, once it's already happened, you know, people might panic or otherwise respond in bad ways. Um, in response to some of what uh, Mark and uh, Robin said, um, I think that there's sort of two main paradigms. Um, um, and sort of one is near and medium term AI, um, where it's, you know, can do some of the things that humans can do. Um, and the other is long term AI, it's or where it can do all of the things that humans can do and also much more bes besides. And we have to be worried about both and we have to like take them both into account, but they're really, really, really different from one another. Um, and so with near term and medium term AI, you know, at least for the next decade or two, um, I do agree that, you know, it's mostly comparable to types of economic re revolutions that we've seen before, which is why I don't expect things like, you know, mass unemployment or something like that, because, you know, we've been through this, we've automated, you know, 97% of the agriculture jobs, we've automated the manufacturing jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but with, you know, very long-term AI or very long-term being like 50 or 100 years or something like that, um, what we're essentially doing is we're moving from a world where humans are the only intelligent species and all of our civilization, all of our economy, all of our government, everything relies on the assumption that, you know, every, every intelligent entity that matters is going to be human and is going to be 99.9% .9 identical to you, um, to a world where you have multiple intelligent species that may be very, very unlike each other, you know, less like each other than humans are like, you know, zebras or like fish. Um, and so I think you, you, it's very, very hard to sort of plan for that because sort of most of the analogies break down. Um, like, some people mention the analogy of like raising a child or, you know, an animal raising their offspring, you know, when an animal is doing that, it's putting like a very, very, very thin veneer on sort of like a whole, you know, base of millions and millions of years years of existing biology. And um, when you like invent a new intelligence from scratch, um, you're sort of looking like not just at the top layer, but like all of the 9,999 layers below that. Um, and so it's really sort of very, I think, very difficult to predict because like, you know, the, the whole notion of maybe even, we don't really know, but maybe the notion of an economy breaks down because, you know, if there are 10,000 other species running around, you know, who knows to what extent private property rights, you know, even analogize to them. Um, and so uh, I think probably, probably the biggest risk that I worry about that like most other people or even most other people here would not worry about is just sort of like general instability or like people not knowing how to handle this causing problems. Okay, could we quickly before we move on from extinction to um, other scenarios, uh, because this is not the only one on the table, right, hopefully. So uh, really quickly by giving the microphone back, uh, years in which you, um, years until you expect that we hit um, transformative AI. Um, I don't really know, but I think it's reasonably likely to be this century. This century. By reasonably likely, I mean within the century. Yeah. Before century. Yeah. Transformative AI. Yeah. Not AGI. Well, artificial generative intelligence or oh, an AI that is so transformative that. Um, within thirty years. Uh, Industrial revolution scale impact centuries. Fifty years. Uh, I think I'd say the odds are 50-50 inside 20 to 25 years. Yeah, and probably like, let's say 35% on 20 years. Has this changed recently? Uh, I'd say in the last five years? Uh, it's changed in the last five years. It's probably like a factor of three or four up in the last two, five years. Wow. I probably, okay. As in like the probability within 20 years is a uh -huh. factor of three or four up. Okay. 
Uh, one really quick question before we move on to racism. You mentioned um, DeepMind is good at publicity. There's there have been other um, equally important um, developments in AI. Which ones are they? So examples would include gated attention models that do really well, re have gotten reading comprehension up to like, you know, second or third grade level reading comprehension. Uh, all of the models that made progress on uh, like from from basic convolutional neural networks up to like doing better at humans. Uh, better than humans at image recognition in, in at least stylized contexts. Um, visual question answering is very impressive. So this is uh, where you give a neural network a, a photograph and then ask it in English, what's in this photograph? Like, you know, is there pizza? Is it vegetarian pizza? And um, the, this is not a solved problem, but the fact that progress is happening rapidly on this problem is, is staggering to me from a traditional computer science perspective. Um, uh, translation has been moving really fast, so certainly also not solved. Get gener uh, um, generative adversarial networks are really impressive at doing creative uh, things, at least in bounded domains. Um, I'm trying to actually literally get to 10, uh, but uh, uh, I think people should get the flavor that if you look at machine learning and you just say, well, what happens when you apply machine learning to like interesting problem X in the world? The answer is never, or, like very rarely nothing. Like, like the, the field is making progress on all of these different fronts simultaneously. Um, I totally agree with Matt, but um, one thing that I do want to add because I am an AI engineer, I you know go into work on write AI software every day, um, is that there has been tremendous progress in the field of machine learning and certainly more this decade than last decade, but you still have to be very careful to see, um, you know, if, some, if, if, if something is claimed, like if someone says this machine learning system can do X or it can do Y, you know, what exactly has been demonstrated and with just extrapolation? Because in a lot of domains, it's really, really easy to give the impression of a system that's sort of much more capable than it is. Um, going back all the way to 1966 and like the Elizabeth running on PDP ones, where a lot of people were chatted with the Elizabeth for like long periods of time. And uh, I, I think in some cases, you know, some some of them were, you know, even after talking with it for an hour or two hours, were still convinced that it was an actual person that they were talking to rather than a uh, computer. But of course, you know, Eliza is very simple. It was, you know, basically a few thousand lines of code. Um, and uh, I, I do think there have been some instances of uh, overhype where uh, someone comes out with a paper, um, it says, oh, we, we've solved this challenge in artificial intelligence, we've tested it on toy examples. Of course, you know, it will be simple to, to extend this to, you know, much more complicated examples than real, real, world, data, real world data sets. Um, but uh, often that's a lot harder than it seems. So uh, trust but verify, as the saying goes. Uh, this has happened dec for every few decades for a long time. Uh, so, so the key question is this time different. If you say this time different, look at these demos. They didn't have those before, but they had other demos before that were unprecedented. So the key question is how do you tell that this time's different? Hey, I, I want to revise my previous uh, 50 years or clarify it rather. Um, there's, because there were two things being mentioned and they weren't clearly distinguished. There was transformative and there was AGI. Uh, I think on transformative, the answer is let's say negative five years, um, uh, that our world is already being transformed in a accelerating way by the level of machine learning that we've achieved and the things that it can do. Um, uh, the uh, natural language translation is just a really great example of not just impressive capability, but a real change in human society in, in our ability at much less effort to understand each other across, across language barriers. Um, so, um, and I think that's going to accelerate. I think that um, the speed with which machine learning is accomplishing amazing things and amazing things of tremendous practical value is accelerating fast. And I think there is gonna be, you know, if you wanna call it a foom, a uh, little bit of a foom there, um, uh, the, uh, th what I, when I said 50 years, I was taking the question to be um, not making use of this capacity in an accelerating, growing manner in a way that transforms civilization, but uh, the transition to where the sense that we have that each other are sort of um, conscious valuing, valuing beings um, whose you know, utility we value, whatever, whatever terminology you want to talk about that, um, 
uh, I think that we can postpone that for a long time while, while reaping all of the productive fruits of AI while still having it be um, you know, machines serving our purposes and without us expanding the, um, you know, the ethical issues with all the ethical quandaries to include them as first class creatures. I think that is coming, but I think that there's we can basically have all the revolution we want for the next 50 years before we get there. I just a couple of clarifications. Like, I think a couple of people were responding as though I was sort of claiming, well, progress in all of these fields, these directions means that those directions are solved, and like that hype around the application of whether it's reading comprehension or anything else is justified or visual question answering. I, I think in many cases those problems are really hard, and all we're seeing right now is some measurable progress towards solving a really hard problem. But, you know, Robin, I, I think what I would want to see before I was willing to believe we could see another AI winter is that this progress slows down and stops, right? And so, you know, as long as we've got year after year with, with spectacular improvements on problems that we previously didn't have a way to tackle, um, I'm willing to, to sort of take a significant uh, you know, fraction of my betting odds as saying, oh, we're actually on a path that works. These types of neural networks, maybe with some, some further architectural innovations uh, and a lot more compute and, and neural architecture search and a bunch of other things applied to them are what intelligence is made out of. We don't yet know the architecture that, and, and the training environment that gets you all the way to generality, but probably it's made out of this stuff. Um, at a basic level. Um, moving on maybe from um, extinction to what happens if we don't go extinct, right? Um, and we don't have very much time left to cover. And, uh, I, I do think this is a, a scenario that hasn't been discussed very much yet, which is why I really want to touch on it. So in Age of M, you mentioned um, the scenario of a race to the bottom, that the system might not be so bad. And you recently you tweeted, um, my guess is that this would be one of the hardest things for post-Dreamtime folks to understand about us Dreamtime folks. Why did so many of us rich folks work so hard when we could have just slacked and taken it easy? So <laughs> could you quickly um, have like, discussed this um, general scenario of race to the bottom? What does it mean and what does it mean to be a subsistence? And then I want to hear everyone else's opinions on how bad this subsistence is. Ah, uh, so a whole bunch of things all in that package. <laughs> so, so first of all, there's the observation that our era is unusual compared to history in that we are living well above subsistence level. And the, the straightforward explanation for that is we found a way to grow wealth faster than population. <laughs> and if we ever find a way to grow population fast, that goes away. And so a, a key question about the future is how robust is the scenario where, where, where wealth grows faster than population? Is this a temporary exception, as it seems to be historically, or is it the start of a new trend? So I tend to lean toward it looks like, subsistence looks robust in a competitive world. So if there's enough competition, then that seems like we would eventually find technologies to make population grow fast, so we'd return to subsistence. And so then I said, well, then that looks like we're in this unusual era, and from the point of view of the past or the future, they look at us as this unusual era. And then I noticed a few other things unusual about era. And I said, this is the dream time. This is this unusual era that people will look back on with a special charm and attention because we were so unusual, and especially in the, in the way of being rich individually, having a lot of individual autonomy and, and discretion, and being, uh, being able to say to evolution and, and all the pressures and competition because we have all this ability. Uh, now, many people have looked at this trend over the last few centuries. They really liked it, and they projected a future where that continues a Star Trek, a culture future where, where wealth per person just continues to increase. And... Um, what do you say? Enlightenment now is one of those. Say again? Enlightenment now is one of those. I'm, I'm not sure because I, I haven't read it. But, but I actually think a lot of our attitude changes have been caused primarily by wealth changes. <laughs> and so many of the attitude changes that we celebrate over the last few centuries are probably caused by the wealth changes. And so w if wealth switches back, <laughs> Attitudes may switch back, and so we may not have the expanding circle of moral concern, et cetera, because those may have been caused by wealth. So uh, with that perspective, then you ask, so my Age of M is a concrete example of a, world, a worked out scenario where that's true in that world. It's not at all guaranteed to happen, but at least you can see all the mechanics. You can think through the details and see, yes, this is a world where that happens, and this is how it happens, and you can get that you could have descendants who are technical, technologically advanced and very well informed and well educated and understanding, and yet be poor, <laughs> and have many of the correlates that go along with being poor, including changes of attitudes. So uh, that would just be an example. So if you say, that now, uh, my main 
complaint about the way you're framing this is you're saying, well, will the future be you know, these five things? And that's as if the future is one time and place, and we're going to make one choice, and that's, that'll be the end of it, and we'll be done for that. So, so age of M is, is one... Extinction. Well, extinction is, by definition, a permanent thing, but everything else is, is temporary, in a sense. And so the age of M is just one scenario of, a, of, a, of an era that may only last a year or two in objective time, and after that I don't say what happens. And so I could say after that maybe we'd have other errors and they'd be different, and I don't know, and I don't know that there's a permanent answer, but you could still ask your attitude toward what if there is a future error where subsistence comes back, how do we feel about that, how hard do we want to fight to stop it, do we, can we stop it, I mean, those are all valid well, questions, I think. In, in terms of like meditations on Moloch or in, in other, in Nick Bostrom's Future of Human Evolution and some others, it seems to be suggested that um, this race to the bottom, especially when brain emulations uh, are around, and if we don't develop AGI, um, that might be locked into an end well, state of... Um, so I'm sure Mark has also has opinions on this, but basically I see a lot of attitudes toward the future as focusing on this axis of I, I would call governance versus competition. <laughs> and for many people, they look at all the different problems and they think, oh my God, those are terrible problems. The only solution is governance. We got to have more governance. <laughs> and they are hoping for that. In a world of competition, they say, look, without, comp without governance, this competition world, all these terrible things can happen. And those are the MULOC failure to coordinate scenarios. People imagine all sorts of terrible things. And the key question is, is, is a world of competition really that bad? And that's, you know, we economists tend to be, think competition is relatively okay, at least in the short run. Um, but that's a key attitude, and, and I'm, I'm sort of open on that. I, I would actually say I'm worried about equally of, of we having too much coordination and too little. <laughs> I can see things going badly both directions. And oh, so, uh, well, too much coordination means we have some central government that takes over and now can lock in our future. Yeah. A, a, a central singleton has the risk of whatever it wants or doesn't want gets locked in and that's the end of that. I'd quickly love to like go around and say, what do you think about the general scenario of a race to the bottom? Or if we're not racing to the bottom, at least temporarily until we're racing girls, where are we racing to generally? Uh, I think that certainly once you get something like strong AI, anything like a race to the bottom is pretty quickly going to turn into a race to extinction or something analogous to extinction. Record without extinction. <laughs> no, because we talked about extinction before, and especially in terms of AI, right? So if we don't go extinct, if like that percentage doesn't occur right now, then what is the alternative scenario? She's saying their interact competition leads to extinction. Okay, so uh, like oh. doomed, doomed like 100%. Um, uh, the analogy I would use is like um, you're flying a fighter jet at uh, Mach 3 and the throttle gets stuck and you, and you can't slow down. What happens is not you go faster and faster until you're traveling at 90% of C. What happens is that you crash. Like if you if you have this very complex system that's very hard to control, and like you lose so much control over it that you get into this positive feedback loop that you can't get out of, like it's not going to end well. I think earlier they said like the main problem of complex society is its complexity. The, the throttle has always been stuck. <laughs> yes, but the plane wasn't traveling so fast. <laughs> Mark and I were talking about this race to the bottom and the M scenario, but. Um, our vision, Mark, you can elaborate on this, was that, uh, as Robin was just saying, this the, we don't have, even if you have this M scenario, you don't have it perhaps for very long. And so the point is, it's not, it's not even clear you need to go there. I mean, these, instead of M's being these entities that are racing to the bottom, they could just be computer programs racing to the bottom. They don't have to be conscious entities at all. So in that sense, it doesn't matter if there's a race to the bottom because they're not entities. Um, uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. But, but um, uh, I hate the phrase race to the bottom because uh, it assumes its conclusion. What we're describing is a race. Um, and, uh, you know, let's take, let's, let's, let's say that, you know, Robin's discussion about dream time over the last 200 years. Okay, let's take a look at the entire history of life on this planet up to the last 200 years. Let's just take the, the, two, the dream time of the last 200 years off the table for a moment. Um, the rest of life it wasn't in dream time. It's at subsistence. It made it over 4 billion years or so from bacteria to, you know, complex... Um, uh, interesting creatures with lives and, and interactions and families and, and experiences. And then very, very recently, uh, humans and writing and civilization and art. Uh, that all happened by this criteria 
in a world of subsistence. So that was the race to the bottom. That wasn't the bottom. That was a race upward. That was a race that we, we all prize the overall direction of. Um, it was a race towards increasing sophistication, increasing complexity, increasing adaptive complexity, increasing cooperation. Uh, many, many lives of many, many creatures, including humans, that were worth living and that we're all glad were lived. So let's stop ta identifying subsistence as a race to the bottom. The race is a race to be more efficient. Uh, and the logic of evolution, once again, um, the system will be dominated by uh, the by the by the winners of the selection process it will be dominant the the uh, things that are efficient engage in more useful activity per mass energy consumed that's sort of what it means to be efficient so weighted by activity most activity is by efficient things the overall system is continuing to create surpluses here and there that are that are vast, incredible surpluses compared to the entirety of our dream time. And, the, um, and when you weight the system that, that we're talking about in terms of the creatures that we care about it, more and more of it can be in the, in the uh, surplus area of huge returns to capital um, uh, where the stuff that's at subsistence either is not suffering at subsistence, is in fact growing the way the history of life grew, or is just instrumental and it's not something that suffers or doesn't suffer. And it's just serving the purposes of efficiently creating the productivity that creates the surpluses that we're occupying. Um, I think the distinction between M's and AI's is is an interesting and weird one. Uh, like five or six years ago, Anders Sandberg and I uh, sat down and tried to write a paper analyzing the brain emulation scenarios and, and gamed out um, what properties emulated human brains would either certainly or very likely wind up with, and they become very weird and alien very quickly. Um, and then if you add AI in general, you just get the space of possibilities just gets more vast and weird and and different to us, and so I think that that that, that space of of alien possibilities is what makes these kind of decisions we make now and in the next, whether you believe it's twenty years or hundred years, really interesting, is because we we kind of have this founder effect on the nature of the life that follows us, um, and to kind of explain what I mean there, like yes, you can have individualistic intelligences that are very competitive and compete over resources either economically or if you get you have insecure computers it won't be economic competition it'll be uh you know hacking competition to get the resources or competition to build fabric semiconductor fabrication plants really fast um, but you could also have m very different things right you could have hive minds that share thoughts we were talking about this idea before and it's it, it seems quite plausible that at this moment in history both of those futures actually exist and work and and like you could you could walk down a path and get one and you could walk down a path and get another it's like not all that surprising that there's a vast biodiversity of of possibilities. And so I think one of the, like one of the interesting super hot, like probably too hard to answer questions we face is like how do we guide that process? And so I'm maybe more open than some of the more libertarian voices on this panel to the idea that we try to guide it, that we try to build institutions and agreements that are like, yeah, let's not allow ruthless competition over CPU cycles because that leads to natural selection that leads to a type of organism or in a type of world that doesn't have room for us or, or the things that we value. It may be fine in other terms, but if we have a choice, like why not keep, uh, keep ourselves around as pets for the future that like is more fun to live in? Yeah, so the original question was where are we going if yeah. we don't all die? Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Where are we going if we don't all die? Yeah, so I guess it seems like a really salient fact is the future is super long. So like, as we, so I agree that it's like worth thinking about the age of M as like, you know, you want to think about what's going to happen next because that happens before all the stuff that happens after. But like, again, that's like three years. And like after that, you have some other period that's like, you know, three months. And then you have after that, like a hundred trillion years. And then just like the dynamics we're talking about here, are like not the dynamics that govern the vast, like the dynamics that determine where we end up. But like that's not what the future looks like. Like this is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the future. So like for almost all the future, like, 
um, I guess I would be relatively confident, though certainly not certain, that like we will make some implicit or explicit bargain amongst like all of the people who want things. Like there's a bunch of there's a bunch of agency in the world, and there will be like at the end of all these periods, there'll be like some either implicit or explicit bargain about what's going to happen with the universe. Um, so you can have a world where a bunch of different people own different parts of the universe and get to do what they want with their part. That's like a thing that could happen. You could have a thing where like we fight a war and then we have like one actor who's like, here's what's going to happen with the universe. Um, and it's like very hard to talk about what's actually going to happen, but there's going to be some period of history that's like the kind we're talking about. Then people are going to like come up with some, like whatever you're left with in terms of preferences, those preferences about the universe are going to get implemented over the rest of the, like it's a really long time. Yeah, so I guess there's a few things to be said with respect to competition. Like, you may have two main points to make. So one is that competition, I don't think, has a big effect on the values of agents. So like, if you had a competitive outcome without like any further coordination, then you sort of expect a long competitive period as you expand through the universe. That competitive period doesn't really constrain the preferences of the agents engaging in competition, because like, whatever my preferences are, like as long as I'm patient, I still want to compete. So like, people with all different preferences want to compete to get more resources, and like at the end the preferences of whatever, like whatever the payloads were of those agents, you get to implement those payloads. Um, that's like what I expect to happen in competition world, and we could certainly debate whether that's actually what happened in the competition world. And like in the actual world, like, yeah, I think like we're unlikely to end up with a Pareto inefficient outcome over the long period. Like if you're like, people have a billion years to reach some agreement, like can they reach an agreement that avoids an outcome that like everyone considers worse? Like if you tell me people have like one year, I'm like, yeah, that sounds hard. If you're like, people have a billion, or like our super intelligent descendants have a billion years to reach an agreement, I'm like, yeah. They'll probably reach an agreement, like probably they'll end up with something Pareto efficient, which is why like I'm inclined to describe it as a bargain rather than like an outcome which is constrained by competition unduly. Like I totally agree with competition as a thing which happens and is like extremely important to the environment under, which determines our future. But, like I'm super unsold for the very long term just because of this like they have so long and will be so smart and like. One, one piece of sort of skepticism that I have about Paul's point is the idea that your ability to compete is totally unaffected by your values. I'd give you one part in a million. Like, I'd give you, like, if I have values, like, if I intrinsically value competition, I'm, like, 0.0001% better. I'm, I'm willing to grant that, but I don't know if you're talking about a much larger... Well, I, 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 this is possibly true, but it requires, like, maybe, a, a, like, a level of self-awareness and, and, and um, strategic behavior that humans don't exhibit, right? Humans are not capable of separating Machiavelli, like, like... Machiavellianism from whether they believe that there should be Machiavellianism in the world. It's pretty rare to have humans who can be like, I wish that everyone treated each other honestly, but I'm going to be completely ruthless and backstabbing to bring that world apart. Um, and so I think I, I read in the, between the lines of what you're saying that you think that the agents in the future will have that ability to kind of um, to be Machiavellian while in pursuit of non-Machiavellian ends. Okay, so I totally agree with Robin. I think this period of history is like a weird dream time. Everyone in the future is going to be like, what the hell was happening? <laughs> and like, I think things are not going to look like humans today are weird. This is weird times. I wanted to make uh, one point, which is uh, imagine, you know, thousands of years ago, you are part of the elite of a civilization. You are the rich people, landowners, and there's a lot of poor slate, you know, poor people who are just not, you know, at subsistence levels, and a magician comes to you and says, I could make all of your poor people into zombies. I could take away all of their experience and just make them into people who look like what they're doing but have no experience. Do you want my, would you want me to do this? And, and apparently, if what I'm hearing from some of my co-panelists is, yeah, they'd say, yes, let's keep the elites as conscious people with experience and turn all the other people into zombies. And, I, and my reaction is, what hate? <laughs> I mean, all these people living subsistence lives, they, they are, that's better than them being zombies not existing. And, and so a world of M's that are poor, that living their lives, I'd prefer that world to a world of swapping in software that has no experience. That seems like, it seems that that's a, few, that's a value I'm willing to express. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think Robin's uh, re responding to me, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, the, when people hear the subsistence thing, and people use phrases like race to the bottom, they read into it a dystopianism of the suffering we associate with being at subsistence. And I think that the suffering, the idea that massive subsistence in this future that we're talking about is a world of massive suffering at subsistence is just extremely unlikely. Uh, you're not more efficient if you suffer um, uh, the um, lives at subsistence, like I said, I was very inspired by your phrase, lives at subsistence can be worth living. So either they're going to be populated by tremendous numbers of lives that are worth living, or they'll just be instrumental things that are, that are creating the wealth that those in surplus are living on. Either of those is a positive scenario. Right. 
I'm just making the stronger point, which is just most of you kind of seem to think that most people in history who lived as subsistence, they would have been better off not existing. And, and that seems to me just wrong, <laughs> that you, you should see their lives more from their point of view and understand they mostly had good lives. <laughs> if they would be better to be rich. Yes, it's good to be rich, but... Uh, I don't know if you're including me as one of the people in that in that category, but I think the re if I was going to defend it, I, like I'm just genuinely unsure in you know Paul's spirit about whether the correct thing to optimize for is is total well-being or average well-being or indeed some other thing like fairness or f positive liberty or knowledge or whatever. And because I'm not sure about that, I get nervous about a future where like everything, almost everything, is at like very small positive well-being. I think maybe to. Um to finish this off, um, I think in terms of actionable items, right? Um, we talked a lot, a lot about theory, right? We talked a lot about different potential futures and and um, and value drift and so on and so forth. I think um, you know if you look at the like the forces that are stacked up against us, there they've been like in in in, adequ in adequate equilibria. Um, the three that were mentioned were asymm asymmetric information, misaligned incentive, and collective action problems. Um, there's the potentially the asymmetry between destruction and creation or like offense and defense. We have the law of mad science. We have like a couple of forces that seem to be stacked up against us um, in terms of reaching coordination or of progressing in terms of civilization generally. Um, so um, maybe to, to close this panel, if you each could give um, a quick look out on what do you think are good tools that we should be looking at um, uh, in terms of civilization and what could individuals in this room do to um, push a lever on those tools? Well, I think many of us are in agreement that computer security is a really good idea and would be an excellent tool for a positive future. Um, and two other things that were kicked around as being uh, positive would be um, any kind of tool that helps ensure political freedom and um, medical research tools. So those are three tools that I would vehemently favor. As a professor of economics, I will claim with some confidence that we actually know a lot about better social institutions. <laughs> we know a lot of ways many social institutions could be substantially better. Not only do we know them in the abstract and theory and lab experiments and things like that, what we don't know is to get anybody to care. <laughs> and the main way they need to care is to actually try things out on small scale and work their way up to bigger scale. So the, you know, if you can find any way to get people to actually care enough about changing institutions to be willing to try them out, that's the big win. My book new book, The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life, has a theory about why we're less so uninterested, but still, uh, you can defy the odds and <laughs> try to be more interested. So I want to elaborate uh, with one mechanism on both what Christine was saying and what Robin was, was saying. The thing that makes computer insecurity look like an, insert, an, a, an impossible goal is that the infrastructure we've got, the infrastructure that, that our entire industrial base rests on right now, is not just insecure, it's insecurable. Uh, it's, 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 it's architecturally based on the wrong premises, but the fact that our civilization is resting on it means that it's deeply entrenched. And even when we're faced with existential dangers, uh, um, somehow escaping the attractor of the installed base can be impossibly hard. Um, the, we've lived through one revolution against the installed base in the computer industry within, within my memory, which is when I grew up, it, the entire industry was dominated by mainframe software running on mainframe hardware. It was a whole ecosystem um, of interacting parts, it was very easy to imagine that as personal computers rose up, while well, they would just, uh, you know, be attracted into that ecosystem, uh, become an extension of that ecosystem, and, the, and that the installed base would just extend into this new realm. It's not what happened. Um, the new ecosystem that grew up grew up small in the shadow of the mainframe ecosystem, but coexisted with it, was able to grow and thrive. Uh, didn't have enough use for what was in the old ecosystem to be sort of infected by this attractor of making use of the old ecosystem by bringing it in, uh, and eventually it grew into a position of strength from which it overthrew it. Um, right now, we have for the first time 
an ecosystem called the, that often referred to as the blockchain sector, I prefer the term crypto commerce, in which insecure, crappy software dies quickly. Uh, there's been bug after bug where a small bug in a small program called hundreds of, caused hundreds of millions of dollars to disappear overnight with no recourse. Um, this ecosystem is going to be populated by the survivors of that winnowing process. Um, and it gives, we're early in the process, um, but it gives us a chance to grow a, a new stack from the foundations all the way to the user where the stack is built with proper attention to security and um, judging by what we're seeing so far, it's also not being heavily infected by the attractor of trying to actually be ba actually use legacy software and 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 be enmeshed in the legacy world. It's to a large extent, it's building a new stack. It's building it under the severe pressure for security, computer security issues that I've been working on for 30 years. Suddenly, people care. I've been frustrated for 30 years that people don't care. In this sector, people care. And I just also wanted to. Uh, part of the, the, the Robin part of the elaboration uh, is um, uh, part of what's going on in this area is smart contracting, which from this perspective can be seen as new tools for experimenting with systems of governance. So all of these interesting experimental social institutions that Robin um, uh, has, been, uh, you know, has been exploring, uh, there are people in this world, including, by the way, prediction markets, yeah, uh, including prediction markets, but a whole range of other things that see this as a potential um, medium to grow interesting new governance experiments. Uh, I'm going to do three big categories um, uh, and try and make a few recommendations in each. So the first one is let's get practice at dealing with the already serious problems caused by misspecified objective functions. Whether you're looking at the fact that the advertising funded internet is capable of swinging political outcomes and elections in apparently random crazy ways. Uh, let's figure out how to not have that happen. Let's figure out how to not have, you know, Volkswagen being able to game the emission standards. Let's figure out how to, um, how to deal with climate change, which is basically a misspecified objective function. We failed to include uh, the externalities of, of uh, carbon uh, dioxide emissions in our pricing scheme for all of the commodities in our economy. So let's just practice dealing with hard uh, misspecified objection, objective functions. All of these problems are really hard. Lots of people, can, you, can, you can find careers on, working on any of those. The second category, um, I would say, is like planning for the consequences of living in a world with really capable artificial intelligence. I think that means doing the, the kinds of technical safety work that Paul and his colleagues are doing at OpenAI, and also then asking hard questions about what institutional arrangements need to be in place so that people can have confidence that if this technology gets developed, it's not going to be a disaster for them. And they don't need to drop a nuke on the research lab that's doing it. They can instead have an under, you know, some confidence that if, if this technology emerges and is profoundly transformative, they will share in the benefits and the fruits of that transformation. Um, so that's a really hard governance problem. Uh, there are lots of careers there. Then the third category, I'm, I'm with Christine and others, computer security. I think what we need to do there, there's a list of things. We need to go back and formally verify as much software as we can possibly rewrite in a formally verified form. Um, we need to fuzz everything we ship systematically and have automatic updates on all of the, the software that we have in every Internet of Thing object you can find. And we need to also change the economics of this. And I think a lot of that actually turns at the moment on governments. Governments currently find, like hire enormous numbers of people to find bugs in things and then stockpile them in order to be able to break into other countries' systems. We need to change the, um, the dynamics there so that for, for every one bug that a government stockpiles, they're fixing nine um, out there in the world. And I think that serves the needs of the, uh, the defense contracting industry that does that work just as well as the current situation, but would make us all safer and give us a better world if, the, if, if more of that apparatus w w was focused on, on getting us uh, secure computer infrastructure. So I think that's my, my draft list. So I guess I'm enthusiastic both about fixing, there's a bunch of problems right now, like short-term problems. So in particular, the ones I think most often about are, like, 
I think AI alignment, we haven't really talked about it. I think it's like a pretty large fraction of the future value being destroyed. I think it's like a pretty good thing to try and resolve. Um, I think a related thing that's relevant across a bunch of technological risks is like peace is pretty good. It's like a cliched thing to want, but like it's a good thing to intervene on if you, to the extent you can. Lots of people care, so it's hard to intervene on. Um, and then apart from like problems that might actually kill us in the short term, I think just improving institutional quality, um, whether that takes the form of improving existing institutions or piloting and pushing new institutions. I'm pretty enthusiastic about better institutions. I tend to agree that like people mostly don't care, but like caring is a very complicated concept. Um, or improving individual decision making. Those both seem pretty great. Um, I think we have like a pretty good, overall our situation is like pretty good for changing the future, I think. Like existing humans right now have it pretty great compared to any other humans. Um, and probably will the last humans who ever will get to live and have an effect on anything, so we should enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> So um, despite all of the emphasis uh, on AI and progress in AI, I think w the biggest class of tools that people are still underestimating is like narrow AI tools that are used to solve some specific problem. Like I haven't researched it, but one that just comes to mind just from your example is like, you know, what if you had a narrow AI that made it much simpler and much easier to write, you know, secure industrial control software? Um, how practical is this? I have no idea, but you know, Given the state of the machine learning literature, you know, uh, I, I, I bet no one has really made a serious attempt on it so far. And so, you know, I, I'd be inspired to see someone try. Um, in response to what Peter said regarding types of AI, um, uh, and like specifically AI not doing what you want, um, I think you have to make a really hard distinction and use different terms to refer to like, you know, computer software not doing what you want or like not doing what a human wants versus other humans and other institutions like not doing what you want or like acting in counterintuitive ways. Um, they're both very real problems and they're both very important, but they're so different from each other that I think you need different words. Like there's no, sing there's no one single word in English that refers to both the US Postal Service losing your package and like not knowing where it is. And on the other hand, like your hard drive crashing and losing all of your email, they both involve loss of information, but like they're so different from each other that we don't use one word to refer to the same thing. Uh, David, the, reason I, I lumped them to, the reason I lumped them together is that if you have a like a large, well-funded organization with a, an objective that it's pursuing in a very organized way that is misspecified, then it will turn around and deploy narrow or general artificial intelligence systems. Smart humans will deploy it to do what they think the correct thing to do is. And yet, if that institution has uh, like set up incentives that are that are problematic, they'll be deploying AI systems to accomplish those problematic objectives. So I think that like it's the the, the um, objective blurs between the human institution and the software that they deploy to pursue it. Okay, so. That was like a quick race uh, for everything. I think in, in terms of everything, you know, we could each, each and every one of those topics we could have covered in, in much more depth, especially like the um, technical alignment um, landscape, which, which you've written a technical alignment landscape on. Um, all of those are really big buckets, I think. Um, I'm, and we've only made a glance. I hope that this conversation continues a little bit tonight and then um, actually spark some action. Let's stick around for a little bit um, and talk to whoever you most or least agreed with. And thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> thank you.